so thank you everybody for coming on a, a rainy night, the you know, post long weekend. Um, I, I understand it's sort of tough to, to haul yourself out and not just go home and cuddle up and read a book or something fun like that. Um, before I, I get started, I'd just like to get a sense of, of who we have here tonight. So I'm wondering if you could put up your hand if you work for a nonprofit and are directly involved in fundraising. That's a majority part of, of your job. Um, and if you work for a nonprofit and you're involved in the communication side and social media. And what about those people who are supporting wonderful nonprofits with their wonderful skills as, as consultants or service providers um, in other areas? That's it. Okay, thank you very much. So, what I'm going to talk about tonight is, um, is, is not so much, um, I mean, I think we're all still figuring out how to make money using social media, so this isn't a, a set of rules of those, like, 10 things you must do. This is more like a recipe we've been working on for a while, and uh, I don't know how many of you uh, like to cook, but, you know, there you start off and you follow the recipe the first time, and, um, and I have a magnet that sits on my fridge that I'm very fond of that says she didn't always follow the recipe. And the idea is you, you, you do it the first time, and you're like, ah, I think I need to change that recipe. I think it needs a little more bite or a little bit more lemon juice or this or that. And we've sort of been playing around with how to make more money from social media for the last couple of years and trying things out and testing them. This is what we found uh, works for us. And this um, presentation looks a lot different than it did when I first wrote my description of what I'd be talking tonight back in May because the recipe's changed. We've tried it out a few times and we've, um, we've made some leaps forward and, and we've had to revisit some things. So um, I like taking questions throughout. If, um, if, you have, if you have something, and just uh, jump in and ask, and I will try to remember to repeat your questions so we, um, so we get it for the recording. And, um, and then if it's, you know, if it's something that's coming up that I'm going to go into more detail in a slide or two, I'll ask you to hold that thought, but I'll, I'll try and do it as we go along. So before I get started, I think I should do what I always do when uh, giving a talk for the SPCA, which is acknowledge the uh, metaphorical elephant in the room. We have puppies and kittens. We do, and it makes our job great because puppies and kittens I mean, you go to AFP and everyone starts to talk and says, no, it's not like we could all have puppies and kittens. And we actually have puppies and kittens. And then you have, you know, people like M10 who are wonderful people, but they're using puppies and kittens because puppies and kittens work. So I, the first couple of times I gave fundraising talks about stuff I was doing at the SPCA, people would get to the end and be like, but I can't do this because I don't have puppies and kittens. So what I'm talking about is the changes we've observed from a point two and a half years ago when we still had puppies and kittens to now while well, we still have them. So it's, you know, I, I think that regardless of the topic, it's, there, there's ways to, to make it work. And it may be that what we've, um, what we've found works for us doesn't work for everybody. But it's a recipe. You can adapt it as you will. So we had a, um, what we did as part of the challenge a couple of years ago. We have great online revenue, and it continues to climb, and that's wonderful. But I sort of turn it past it. Like, it spikes when we get a story in the media. It spikes when it spikes at Christmas, when it spikes for everybody. But it's, there's not a lot we can do to drive that beyond um, being out there and having a good brand and, you know, trying to make sure the media stories are all positive about us and stuff like that. It, it's not directly in response to an ask we're making. Where we were making asks, and when we, when we had our e-blast series, we were underperforming. We were really underperforming compared to anything else we were doing. And that was this had this whole trigger effect on a lot of other stuff we were doing. We had a really low sick and gift rate from our online donors. Um, we, uh, we weren't, so we were, you know, it was brand new people and every year, a lot of brand new people, but we think, wow, if we could just retain more of these people, we could do great things. So we're looking at trying to find a mechanism that would 
actively start engaging people to get that second gift and make their online giving more of a habit, like direct mail donors tend to be, have more of a habit, and we wanted to create that habit with online donors. And we wanted to create a mechanism for bringing in new donors in a way that wasn't so passive. Gee, I hope we have some good news stories this week. Or, as the case may be, unfortunately, we saw some bad news stories that drive um, online donations to us. So th these were some of our challenges that we were facing. And one of those symptoms, and, and I don't think we're uh, alone in this, is we have really high um, engagement but on uh, social media, but a very small percentage of those are actually donors. And, um, and that, that figure, that 4.2%, uh, um, granted, is based on emails. So for donors where we don't have their email or they have two emails, we haven't necessarily been able to identify them. But it's not going to go up from 4.2% to 75%. There's a low rate of our donors and our, our people who are following us in social media um, and I should say as an aside right now, what, where we're seeing success is in Facebook right now. We still haven't cracked any sort of, uh, any sort of code on, uh, with uh, Twitter fundraising that I would, would call a success. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about tonight is Facebook. So those numbers are pretty low. And we can either choose to be depressed about that or see that as this great opportunity with low-hanging fruit of these are people who are already really engaged with our mission and if we just speak in the whatever grabs them, then it's low hanging fruit. We've got a lot of potential donors out there. And looking at what we have been doing online, we've, you know, we've been using uh, Facebook for quite a while to push out uh, our, our different fundraising activities. And really what we were seeing is it did okay in driving registration for events. So sometimes those are peer-to-peer -peer fundraising events, like a walk, and that would, have, um, that would have revenue implications down the road, but in directly translating to any sort of revenue, it was, it was pretty insignificant. So we started shifting we, what we had been doing. We had um, different, uh, we would send out monthly e-blasts to our, our e e uh, supporters list. And they'd be about different topics that were timely at that time of year. There would be little uh, baby wild animals in the spring, and, and or it would be about hot dogs in cars in the summer, and it would be timely, and people could not care about it at all, didn't respond. And so we replaced that with more of a, a campaign model where we had a microsite that had the, the goal thermometer and the leaderboard and the peer-to-peer -peer capacity and the um, and social sharing. And we approached it more like a campaign. We're not going to do one thing a month. We're going to have a couple of campaigns a year and we're going to you know, have a number of communications. We're going to talk to um, our general supporters list, and we're going to talk in an additional way to those people who sign up for peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and provide them coaching emails. We're going to talk in a different way yet again to those people who've done it and ask them to take that next step and share our campaign and reach out to their friends and family. And we're going to make this more multi-vehicle, so we're going to provide um, paper or hard copy document support like posters for all of our branches around the province. We're going to, you know, we'd already been um, involved, including it in social media, we're going to continue to do that. We're going to um, tie it in with our, our earned media. We're going to occasionally tie it into our direct mail so that we have this more consistent campaign approach to what people, to what we're seeing. So we, we started off a couple years ago with a Christmas <coughs> campaign. And in this case, we made peer-to-peer uh, -peer giving the, the first ask. We didn't ask people to give a gift. We said, would you please sign up to ask your friends and family to give, make a gift? And we, we had a home with a goal. It, it doesn't look, um, you know, it sort of has a, a bit of ugliness to it, and uh, coming from a big direct mail background, I'm a big actually believer, and sometimes ugly works better than slick. 
in fundraising. It's the pity donation. So it's, it's not the prettiest thing I've ever seen. But we had a home with a goal. We made peer-to-peer -peer the first ask, and we saw a huge increase in revenue. So we, this was our sort of first part in our recipe. OK, we're doing something by just having a home. We're doing, we're doing something right. But we didn't see necessarily a, a huge increase in revenue coming from social media. Although we started to see an increase in people sharing our campaign on Facebook. So at least now it had moved beyond our posts that we were putting out talking about it to people, um, to people sharing uh, both, um, both through Facebook and, um, and through their own email networks, uh, much less on, on Twitter and, um, and, and, and Pinterest and anything else. So we're pleased with this. This is we're looking at December 2011 was our old model. December 2012 was our new model. I'm going to share share numbers with you to give an idea of we we made a big jump for us. You know, when we when we're looking at the whole Christmas season, when we send out these series of emails, and even though our online revenue is great from the e-blast, we're looking at under 4,000, and so and the next year we can take that to just under 4, 140,000. That's a big jump for us. And so we're like, okay, we've got some things in this recipe right, but we, we still need to, to work on this. One of the positive things that we saw about this was that we're suddenly bringing in new donors through our eBlast campaign. You know, we rarely, maybe someone when we're sending out an eBlast would say, oh, I, this sounds like a good idea. My aunt really loves her dog. I'm going to pour it into her. She'll be interested, but you know, five. And then we're, we're climbing to, to 102 new, new donors. So we, we increased our revenue, we're engaging people, we're getting more second gifts from online donors, and we're bringing in more new donors. So it's, it's inching us, to where, uh, us towards where we want to go. So are these numbers just for peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, or is it Ah, so I'm glad you asked. Thank you. That's, that's the interesting thing. So we made peer-to-peer -peer our first ask. Not a lot of people signed up for peer-to-peer. We know this is this is 2012 when peer to peer is our first ask, and peer, and, and then in 2013 as well. We raised as much money in peer to peer as we did from our one time donations the year before, about four thousand dollars. But the guilt gifts, the second gift, you know, we didn't ask for a gift. We said, "Would you sign up for peer to peer?" And then there's just a little donate button on the side of the email. And what we saw was the first ask was so big for people. They're like, I can't do that. I've got holiday shopping. I've got baking. You're asking me this big thing, and I'm feeling guilty. Take my $50. And we saw this huge increase in the one-time gifts by, by not asking for a one-time gift, but just giving that, that avenue for it. So then our... Our second sort of test case that we're looking at this model is our calendar contest. Our calendar contest we had run as an online campaign before, and this is generally in the spring. People submit the pictures of their animals, get their friends and family to donate. The top 13 fundraisers get a page or the cover in our, our next year's calendar. So we had been running this as an online campaign, but we had got a lot of negative feedback from people who were that it was very hard to do any sort of social media sharing. That they basically had to copy and paste the URL and go in and put it in their post, and there was no great mechanism for, for any uh, sort of sharing. So we moved to the same model using the same platform and, and saw that when we went from pretty much not being able to track whether any uh, revenue was coming um, from social media because people weren't, um, they weren't able to link to us while posting it to, um, and we, we could in the back end, but it was very low, to seeing 22% of gifts were coming from Facebook for this. Now, there's a personal connection here. There's a, there's what's in it for me for these people. Their, their friend or their niece or uh, their coworkers saying, I want to get fluffy in the calendar. 
please help me get fluffy in the calendar. It's very, it's equivalent to the reason why you will pledge your friend who is going in a, a run for this or a walk for that where it's a, where they're fundraising for a disease that's very close to them. And you'll donate to them rather than the organization. So we're excited to see this increase, but we're, it's still not for us the, um, the magic recipe because we, we know that this is, very, um, this is still very personal connection for people. But what it does tell us is if we can make that connection in some way, we can start to get that revenue from, um, from Facebook. We've also been quite successful with, uh, with our calendar contest. We, you know, we used to talk about our calendar contest for about six weeks a year. Contest would open, we'd talk about it a lot, and then we'd stop talking about it for a year. Now, the first of every month, we post about our calendar contest. We feature the animal who's in the calendar this month. Have you, um, you know, have you changed your page to, um, I can't, I'm trying to remember who it was this month. I can't remember who it was, two dogs. And uh, if you want to get your, your animal in the calendar, you know, fill out the form, we'll send you a reminder the day the contest opens. And we've been doing that uh, for almost a year now, and we've had a calendar cycle in there, and been able to see that pretty much every time we do one of those posts, it results in about $3,000 in revenue for us. So that's just tracking how many people sign up for the survey and then sign up for the calendar contest when we send out the alert that it's open, and then actually fundraise some money rather than just signing up and being a zero fundraiser. So we're, we're seeing revenue that way too by, um, by making what used to be a very isolated event uh, a full year round, a uh, way to um, interact full year round. But it's, again, it's not, um, it's delayed revenue. It's not direct revenue. I can't believe I didn't get any awes for the cat. <laughs> the cat, Crouton, who is, Crouton came to us after uh, being in a house fire. And so that's Crouton in the, in the Facebook post. That's Crouton when he first came in and had to have his wounds cleaned three times a day and had like nasty burns all over his body and then Crouton in the calendar looking much, uh, much better later on. So we've you know, great storytelling opportunity too, because most of these, um, most of the people who participate in the calendar contest are people we rescue animals, and so we can talk about our core work when we're also celebrating someone's beloved animal and, and getting getting them involved that way. So. Then the, the next way we, we sort of tried out this model was we had a, a matching gift opportunity, a three-year matching gift opportunity that had been given to us for, specifically for our Burnaby branch. And the first year that we had this matching gift opportunity, we did not make the match. We post, posted it um, on Facebook, we sent out e-blasts, we had a banner on our homepage, we put it on the Burnaby branch Facebook, but we didn't meet, meet our match, make our match that year. The second year, same list of people that we're working, starting with, and what, what we ch changed was having this campaign model, having a home where people could keep going in and checking and see where it was going. And that year, this is, we've done this model for two years now, and each of the years we made those, those match. We, um, we made the match and we found so what we sort of learned for recipes that time, for our recipes that time was a lot of people don't necessarily care about whether they live in the community or not. We had this feeling that, well, if it's specifically for a certain area, it's, um, it's a lot harder to get people interested if, if they don't live in that area. And so that, I think, kept some of our fundraising asks very big and general and province-wide because we were afraid to get down to the highly localized and have, you know, so the majority of majority of donors, just because of population base living in the lower mainland, having someone in uh, the lower mainland say, why do I care what's happening in Port St. John? And so that, I think, had, had restricted us a little bit. But what we started finding in this case, 66% uh, of donations came from outside the community. 
And our ask, our, again, our main ask to people living outside the community was not, will you donate to help them to be your match? It was, will you forward this to all of your friends who live in Burnaby and New Westminster? We, New Westminster is also served by the Burnaby friends. We don't know enough people to do this on our own. Will you please forward it? And so, <laughs> and we got, and, and, but again, <laughs> some people forwarded it, and that was great, and they brought in new donors for us. But the majority of people just gave the guilt gift again. So it's asking for the engagement. Um, I think uh, you know one of the things we we often hear people talking about. They're looking for on social media to for, feel more connected and engaged. Um, but the reality is, for a um, lot of people, they don't have the time to do that further engagement, and they they feel better about being asked for engagement and then giving a gift than they do straight being asked for gift. So these were um, some of the where we are trying things out, and so we, you know, we'd seen some spikes in revenue. We had seen that we could increase second gifts. We'd seen we had a model to bring in new donors. We saw that we could go outside of the community, but we needed fairly lo uh, localized, very, um, very personal asks rather than a sort of big help us with our strategy to end cat overpopulation. Which, you know, is nothing new from a fundraising perspective. These are not, um, you know, these are not um, brand new discoveries about how gravity works or stuff like that. But they were, they were building to help us create, um, to, to move, move our, our model forward. So, um, you know, we found we, we needed a home. People like watching the thermometer going up. We needed a home and a goal. And, you know, we, for instance, the first year, or the second year for our Burnaby matching campaign, it met the goal at 10.56 on that night. And I was watching it from home and pressing refresh because I had a couple of offline donations that I could add on there to make it look like it had met the goal. But I wanted to see if it could do it with, with online donations. And, um, and it finished with someone who had previously only given us $20, gave us $1,500. They'd been watching for six weeks, and they didn't want us to lose out. And so they were just waiting and waiting and waiting to see how much we needed. First time they've ever been a major donor. Now we have a relationship with them. And, um, and it was, you know, I don't think they would have changed their $20 giving patterns if they hadn't been able to see that there was, um, ha be part of it, be feel that they're part of reaching this goal and they're seeing it visually. We saw that, I mean, you know, with the, as with our calendar contest, people really needed that personal connection to give via Facebook. And so we needed to find some way to simulate personal connections without everything being <coughs> about people raising money for, you know, there's only so many calendars we can Produce. So we were sort of limited with our, our 13 calendar spots. We can grow that, but we can't do that same model, you know, for our Christmas card contest and our, I don't know what else, or uh, different contests throughout the year. We also found that although we had new donors coming in, they weren't necessarily converting yet to other platforms. There, um, and I don't know how many people work in sort of cross multi vehicle and direct response. Um, I spend a lot of time in direct mail as well. So spend a lot of time looking at these conversion stats and these were not donors who were ever going to give to direct mail. They just, they, they, it was a waste of money. We, we tried, we tested, we tested several different ways. And so this is all coming to give a, a picture of we need sort of a very localized type personal stories that keep on going so people can keep on giving. And we need it to have a home and um, the, you know, they're, they're all coming together to, to give us a picture of, of what we were looking for. So, sort of parallel system to this. We have, um, we, we spend a couple million dollars a year on this. For animals, and that's everything from animals first come into shelters, and they all get a health check. 
and follow up that health check, they'll all get vaccinations. Some of them will get spay and neuter if they're not spayed and neutered. Some of them will require further follow-up care. Some of them will require incredibly expensive um, medical care, surgery, and rehabilitation, and medication. And so we'd have these stories come up that would be sort of extraordinary medical expenses, and about 12 to 20 times a year, we'd put out a media release. And we would say, uh, you know, this kitten, Angel, in Chilliwack, who's going to go blind in their eye, and people would donate. And they, they would call and they'd go into the branch and they'd donate to the branch. And some of them would go online. But our problem was every time we put out these stories, we had no home for this online. So people would go to the Chilliwack branch and make a donation or not make a donation and then call us up in a panic and say, I just gave $50 for Angel and I have no idea where it's going. And it's very important to me that that money is for Angel and only Angel. And please, Assure me, can you go into the system right now and put a note that it's for Angel? And so it was creating a lot of anxiety among donors who were contacting us. And we're thinking if we have, you know, if every time we put out appeal, we have dozens of people contacting us, how many people, many people are going on and going, ah, I can't be sure this is for Angel, I'm not going to give. We also had way more stories, I mean, we've got you know, 25,000 animals that come to our shelters every year. We've, and they're not in the greatest shape. These are animals who've been abused or abandoned. And they're not in the greatest shape. So we have a lot of potential medical appeals. But we can only put out so many media releases a year about this before we're going to get oversaturated. And we also, these are you know, not just in the lower mainland, but around the province, uh, communities where we're holding our Cause for a Cause walk, where we have a pub night, where we have a gala, we have all these other events that we're depending on the goodwill of the local media. And we really can't push it any further than we are currently doing appeal with these medical appeals. So we've got something now that's ongoing, that's localized and very personal. It's about one animal. And we have an unlimited supply of stories. And so this is sort of the, the great combination of we've been developing what it looks like and the structure of it, and now we've sort of got the, um, the coat to hang on or our skeleton frame. So we launch our medical emergencies page. And um, this is why I was saying my, um, my talk has changed a fair bit since May. We launched this April 18th. And we have, um, since launch, we've featured 78 animal cases. So now we've gone from 12 to 20 a year to 78 stories we've been able to tell. And we've, um, we've made about 110,000 on it. So this is, this is now becoming uh, something that's ongoing where we're, um, where we're seeing that we can, we can sustain this on an ongoing basis. But Beyond that, we're starting to see some really positive trends. Uh, oh, I think that's going to... So this is when you click on an animal. Each animal has their campaign page. It has a, a, their story, what they need. It has their goal of what their medical care is going to cost. You can sign up to fundraise for them. Um, you, can, you can share um, on social media. You can do all these things for this particular animal. And so we have, we have these, these stories, so many stories, and we start to see really positive things. Um, like before when we were just doing media releases, only 13% of our stories were ever about cats. Now 43% of our stories are about cats. And here's why this is significant. We've got a huge cat problem in British Columbia. We have a overpopulation of cats, which leads to abandoned and abused cats, which leads to shelters who are not able to take in all the cats that are there in the community, cats staying in our shelters for a lot longer than dogs. We're, we're where we were socially, as a social problem, we're where we were with cats. We're, um, with cats, we are where we were with dogs in about the 1970s. People don't ID their cats, they don't spay under their cats. When they move, they leave their cat behind. So we have this cat problem. And one of our, you know, in our strategic plan, one of our goals is to raise the social value of cats. Except for, here's sort of the kicker, cats don't raise as much money as dogs. 
So whenever we get to the, do we choose a cat story or a dog story, especially when we only have 12 to 20 media releases a year, the dog stories win because there's the potential to raise money on them. And we see it over and over again when, whether we put a media release out, whether we do Facebook ads, two to one click throughs for dogs. Dog, you know, dogs keep winning time and time again. But how can we change the social value of cats if we're not talking about cats? And so for us, from a, a mission point of view, we've got a model now that's allowing us to talk about cats and the needs and the, the problems about cat that cats are facing and fundraise for them at the same time. And this uh, Yuka, it's, it's hard to see, I think, because of the light, but Yuka, Little Kitten was one of our first stories we featured on medical emergencies. Yuka has a concave rib cage, and so, well, did have, and so um, there's no room for heart and lungs, or not enough room, and although Yuka was a very young kitten, as he grew, his, his prognosis was this was a fatal condition because he, he would not be able to breathe and his heart wouldn't be able to continue working. So it was $700 for medical care and we were able to raise that in seven days. This was one of our first ones before we got into a rhythm. And we have a donor emailing us to explain why they gave to Yuka because they also had a hard time breathing. And so for them, out of the 12 animals on the page, this was the animal that spoke to them because they knew what it felt like to not be able to breathe. And so we're, we're starting to see, okay, we're onto something because we're getting these personal connections that people are having to a animal rather than a big picture problem. They're connecting to one animal. We also, um, we had a case this summer where we had um, 22 dogs from a breeder surrender. And if you go on our medical emergency and read their stories, they're pretty clear um, argument why improper breeding practices cause problems because you've got all these dogs that all have the same medical issues. Again, it happens to be respiratory, but uh, needs nasal surgery, needs throat surgery, can't breathe, needs um, nasal and throat surgery. It is repeated over and over again. And when we have you know, 22 dogs come in who have medical costs of $27,000 into a um, shared out among a couple of our branches on Vancouver Island, that's going to cause it to put a huge strain on their medical budget for that quarter, to have that all at once. And so in this case, we were able to, again, take those stories, and because we had now this, this platform where people were coming to look for those stories, able to raise those in that money in 11 days for, for those animals. And I should say at this point, we haven't actually done much. Promote. We've been running this for three and a half months. We've only sent out two e-blasts. Are we um, we are in pilot phase, and we're finding actually re finding what our limits are. We need to have at least ten thousand dollars up on this page before we can send out an e blast, or else we finish all the campaigns up within an hour, and people get angry because they click to donate, and there's nothing there for them to donate to. We found that we need a couple thousand dollars to put out a Facebook post, and so we actually haven't been promoting it that much because we're still working with our branch managers to build our story chain and we, you know, we don't always have as many stories as we want up there. So a lot of, you know, again, if I was giving this talk three or four months from now, it would look different again because we're hoping to build up to a high enough level that we can do some online advertising. If anyone's ever had any great conversion rates from online advertising, please tell me because we get great click-through rates that people don't make that next step and, and donate. And so that will be sort of our, our next thing we're testing once we get the supply of stories going. We also found the, the other thing that this allowed us to do was to give people some focus when they were angry about a cruelty case. We often cannot fundraise specifically for cruelty cases because it's deemed to be prejudicial to the eventual court case that might happen. And so there will be a story in the media, um, Captain the German Shepherd a couple of years ago who's found in a dumpster in kits, and we have people outraged and they want to give money, and we can't actually specifically say give money in Captain's honor. Now, in, often we have other people say that, or we have uh, third-party fundraisers set up for that, but we have a lot of restrictions because 
Although, you know, as a fundraiser, I'd like to take advantage of the story at the end of the day. What we need to make sure is that if this person is guilty of animal abuse, that they that we're not doing anything to prejudice them being found guilty for that. So, but what we are allowed to fundraise for, what the courts do not consider trying to influence the outcome of a case, is the medical care for that animal and the rehabilitation care for that animal. So it gives us a way to, um, for people to channel their frustrations and help, for example, Nelson uh, on the bottom who was, um, who had been shot by a pellet gun seven times and, and also um, cut severely. And people were outraged. And if we had put up a page of, you know, contribute to the cruelty investigation, people would have been all over it, but we couldn't. And so this gave them a way to, to support that animal and show their outrage. I should also say for, you know, just like in a direct mail letter where, you know, we may have spent the whole letter talking about this story, but there's always that caveat near the end of, you know, help, help Nelson and other animals like him. And so, although, you know, we're using these stories, and, you know, we'll say this, we're using these stories to help us fundraise for our medical budget. It's, and if, if we raise more than Nelson requires, then that will help other animals in the community. So that's sort of how it helped us big picture in our mission work. But then we saw some really interesting things when we started to look at, um, to analyze what we were getting. So 34% of the donors to this campaign were new donors. And so it becomes uh, a very cheap acquisition tool for us. And um, again, addressing this problem that we've had of people being one-time donors, 28% of them are making their second gift within three months. We were, we're only three months in. That, that number may get better as we go forward. And 19% of donors are coming from Facebook. So this, for us, is the, the moment where we have <coughs> put together all of what we learned around what an ideal campaign that will motivate our online donors and address some of those challenges we had to begin with. And and bring it all together in one place. And so, for, for you know, so those results for us are, are really positive. And now we're starting to think of like, okay, so we've got this 4.2% of our Facebook, um, people on like, who like our Facebook page are, are identified as donors, and we've got all this other potential for growth. And we've finally found something that is this talking to people, that people are, um, not just responding to our posts about, but feeling comfortable sharing and asking their their friends to support. I mean, I also found you know this. I mean, the the big the big piece there for tonight is that is is what is what we did to start to motivate our Facebook donors, but our Facebook supporters, but a lot of other I thought really positive things of you know twenty seven percent coming from email shares. So when we're saying please share this with your friends and family, that people are actually um, doing that, and not just through Facebook, but through email as well. And also, the 34% um, the, the that are coming from our website, coming from the banner on our website. And, I, and uh, you know, the, we have not seen our other, um, our other fundraising on our website go down during this period. It's not just that this is when they've got a choice of buttons, that just looks like the sexiest one to click. We're seeing this in addition to our other online. So there's people who used to come to our, we know a lot of people came to our website and never donated, but we're getting an, a new uh, slice of them. So not only did we see a lot of positives in the new donors, we also saw some really great results with our existing donors. Um, so 92% of them they're giving patterns from the prior year uh, increased or stayed the same. And then they gave the medical emergency gift on top of that. So we're increasing what people are giving to us. They're not giving in, instead of. We're also seeing that a, a, a huge section of these people, 37%, are monthly donors. And so we've got a very strong, robust monthly donor program. We have great upgrade rates. Every, you know, every in our upgrade campaign every year, we have a significant number of them that will also give a special gift when we send them 
their November mailing. And then on top of this, so now we're talking people's 15th gift of the year, they're giving to, um, to this campaign as well. And then the, the huge, the huge value piece for us when looking at our existing donors is the number of people that were last donors. <coughs> and I, you know, anyone who's managing their last uh, donor portfolio and knows, you know, how um, challenging that number has been over the last number of years, we've seen industry-wide um, response rates drop in uh, pretty much every medium, and that has led to a much larger, um, much larger last donor pool, and it's, you know, it's a lot more expensive to bring in new donors. So seeing um, a positive number like that for us was, was really fabulous. So, I mean, sort of looking at why, why this is working, and it's, it's working in ways we didn't um, expect. We, um, it's become, for many major donors, it's become something that they like. We've got, uh, you know, 11 people who've been giving at major donor levels through this. One of them, um, increased their giving by 1,200% this year because this is, and I, I joke that this is this page is sort of their crack cocaine. They're a little bit addicted, and I'm not sure that eventually I might not feel some moral imperative to get, you know, to, to talk to them about their frequency with which they visit this, but it's a nice problem for us to have. We have, you know, we have a couple of other major donors who are identified major donors who this has become their preferred way of giving because they like to make those personal connections. Uh, we have other people, we have, I think, nine other uh, people who, again, like the Burnaby donor, have never given more than $20, $25 and are now giving as a major donor. So we, you know, we're, that was unexpected for us. The uh, impact it would have on laps donors was unexpected for us. The uh, in increase for you know, social media and second gifts we hoped for, and we were very pleased to see. Is there a question back there? So, uh, just to, to rephrase the question, or does it cause any challenges around, I guess, this money being perceived as being designated to a certain animal? Would that be fair? Yeah, I guess, I guess it's sort of two questions. I mean, that, that's, that's the first one. That's the more important one than what I'm going to say. I'm going to talk about the more social media and social media on this topic on how this is so much about the better for This is in the context of child stalking and uh, Yeah, and so the, so the next part of that question is of whether you know we're getting so focused on the, the personalization and the commodification. So, um, and the first one first are around the designation. What, um, how we handle this is funds raised for this are designated to the community, but not necessarily designated to the community and only medical care in that community. We know we're going to spend $700 on Yuka's care, and we've just raised $700. The reality is we've made, raised more than $700 because people are going into their branch and giving to you. We're raising about 165% of goal for each case. Um, so we're designating it to the community. We're being quite clear of, you know, it'll um, help other local animals if either the medical costs are lowered or we raise um, more than is needed. We, we have had a number of cases where we um, felt sort of an ethical need to have a conversation with a donor. Um, in for uh, one case, for example, where the the animal's prognosis uh, when we when they had first uh, been evaluated, we felt a medical treatment would be successful. Their condition um, deteriorated significantly, and it was felt that it, it would no longer be successful. And there was. 
Um, and we're, no, we're not yet sure whether that animal will make it or not, but they had to reevaluate. And so we, you know, we contacted the donor and said, you know, we, we just want to let you know that in this case, we're not sure that we're going to be able to do this treatment for this animal. It doesn't look like it will be successful. We don't know if there is anything that will be successful. And um, in, in this case, the donor was like, well, can, I, can we find a specialist? I'll pay, and pay more. I would like be really connected to this animal. And they were like, find out how much it's going to cost to save this animal's life and call me back. And then it becomes a, you know, it goes into another ethical dilemma of do you, do you take extraordinary efforts for one animal when that same amount, when survival rate is very slim, when that same amount of money could deliver care for five animals whose prognosis is much better. Um, so we, we haven't, we haven't had any um, outward facing. I mean, people are, when we're in conversations with people, they're very clear that, yeah, I like that particular animal, but I totally get that this is helping medical care for, for all your animals. One of, the, um, one of the issues we do have is more of an internal one, is um, and I'm sure that everyone who works in a nonprofit has had this discussion versus, um, particularly people who work in fundraising, is staff's perception that if we're raising $700 for UPA, that means we have our medical budget of a couple of million dollars a year plus and ever another $700. And we have to keep explaining, okay, at the beginning of the year, we write the budget, the bucket's not full of money. We spend the rest of the year raising money to fill that bucket. So when you, although we say we're raising $700 in UPA's name, it's not plus, it's to, it's to start filling up that bucket. So that's been the, the perception issue we've had around that. And the second around the sort of over-personalization commodification, it's interesting, some of our, um, some of our more long-standing donors have contacted us with concerns they have around the medical emergency campaign, because we had something that we promoted a number of years ago called the Biscuit Fund. And the Biscuit Fund is just contributing to the fund for medical care. And they phone, and there's been a couple of them phone and are outraged. What is this medical emergency? Why can't people just understand that you have medical, a medical, a big medical budget, and just com contribute generally to the biscuit fund and trust that it'll be spent in the right place? And um, and we have these conversations with them about different people respond to different things. And although we really appreciate that they're sort of more far-sighted and can appreciate the big picture. Not everyone's like that. And I, I do have concerns that it becomes a lot harder to talk about the big picture of the societal change, the sort of transformative change we're trying to make when we're talking one animal at a time. And I think that um, that's certainly maybe step two or three of trying to take people's connections to individual animals and connect it back to the big picture again. And there's a question. And then when we talk about goal and we talk about commodification, and, uh, for me, commodification is you know, a number on it. So, yeah, we raised $700 from Yuka, yay, or hey, we got Yuka medical attention. So, I'm wondering how you play those. So, we, um, so it's primarily, um, primarily the, um, the update is Yuka got their surgery, they came through their surgery successfully, they're going to be in. Um, rehabilitation for about 10 days and then they'll be available for adoption. Our vision at the beginning was that we would be sending an adoption update as well and we've had more animals than we expected in this sort of pilot phase and we were working with a really dreadful clunky um, uh, shelter database system that doesn't integrate well with our regular system and we can't set up flags to flag so we're, you know, it would mean individually checking each time. We have had, um, because we're, there's money being raised in the community as well, we have had um, staff throughout the province say, well, uh, could you, for their sake, it's not that we're getting it from the public, but can you reflect on your, um, on your page that, you know, in addition to this money raised online, additional funds were raised in the community and they'll be able to support other animals in the community. So we are reporting back on the fundraising goal on the page 
but not in the email that goes to the donor's desk. It's just an update on the animal. Um, tools. Doing a lot of fancy stuff with Excel in terms of analyzing. We're um, so we um, our website's based on Convio. The medical emergency in our previous campaigns have been based on a give together. So because we were finding Convio wasn't doing what we needed it to do on a campaign model, and we have Razor's Edge as our back end. So we're sort of doing a fair, you know, a lot of importing and um, and then pulling stuff out and and uh, reporting on it. And so we don't have a great tool. Is that, is that something that you simply can't justify it from a cost perspective, or just an organic process that eventually will probably get there? Um, well, I guess this is this is like inviting a sales pitch from anyone in the audience. I haven't found a tool yet that that will analyze all the things I want to analyze. And so, um, so it's easier to do it myself. Do you consider like Nation Builder? Yeah, I've used Nation Builder for um, for some other projects with um, an electoral reform stuff, and I really like it. It um, it has it has a lot of um, the same capacity, and it's very cost affordable for a small nonprofit. So I I think like we happen to be using Give Together. I think to this sort of similar models could be done. We're using a lot of other things out there, and I do particularly like the the tracking that Nation Builder provides. <laughs> there was like hands up and then hands down. Okay. Uh, in terms of the feedback that you're around the medical, like the seminar and all, can you go after you've met that goal, is it possible to then more people want to donate around? You might have mentioned it, but let's mm -hmm. say like a, a new button pops up and says, you can go do that, but you can contribute to help. Yeah, so on, I'm just going to go back. So when people get to the page, all of our pace, our posts don't go to Yuka. If we're putting out a Facebook post about Yuka, it's not going to Yuka, it's going to the page. And we're finding we may put out a Facebook post on Yuka's story and say, you know, visit our medical emergency campaign to help Yuka and animals like them. And what we're seeing is about 55 to 60 percent of the revenue coming in from that will go to the featured animal and the rest will go to other animals. So um, we have um, once in the past three months had a point where we had no stories up here and we had to put up a big flag, big check back soon. There's animals in our care that need medical help. We're getting them assessed by the vets and we'll have their stories momentarily. But generally there's, there's always another story on the um, I didn't put a screenshot of, but down below this, we have, I think, about 12 campaigns up right now. And down below that are the last um, last sort of 12 to 15 success stories where people can click and see the follow-up story to that animal. And each of those has a button of their, you know, thanks for helping Nelson and Cranbrook. There's other animals in Cranbrook that need your help. Click here to um, donate directly to the Cranbrook branch. What's the level of uh, social media literacy within the organization? Like, is there a wide swath of employees that can contribute to your presence in social media, or do you have a tight inner circle? Are you using some of the boots we can manage that? Or that I'm going to call on Marie. <laughs> okay. So um, the question was, um, how are we? Uh, so how are we managing our social media? Do we have? Is that a, a tight group of people that are contributing it to it? Do we have broad? Are we managing it through Hootsuite? Um, I think probably some questions about editorial calendar and, and how it's much we're doing. Just visual and literacy, like you know, what, what kind of internal dialogue is there in the organization to say, this is what we expect. Is there um, a constant uh, level of information that's provided across the organization, or once again, this tight inner circle whose only responsibility is to manage this? Uh, in regards to social media, Not so much about that, 
is there a single like point of contact that is literally the voice of the SPCA in, from a social media perspective? Is there a team, and that team is is um, utilizing tools with a variety of different ways of permission to allow them to monitor and manage your social media presence across a multitude of. of uh, uh, I'm the main social media coordinator. Um, I do all the posts on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all of that. Um, we have a person that helps us direct that post uh, with the Friends of Development, but overall, I'm just someone who's responding to people's social media. And, um, we, uh, for Facebook, I just use Facebook. Um, for Twitter, I use Crowd Social um, for responding and asking um, for conversations. Um, and then for Instagram, So for this, this is um, built through Give Together, and um, and we, when our first campaign through Give Together, we just took it right out of the box. We didn't pay for any customization. We just wanted to see what our results would be. As we've um, as we've seen more results, then we paid for more customization. I know they they're actually there, in I think late fall release is going to sort of allow for a fair degree of branding customization just with the straight out of the box version. Um, having a, a home page like this that features a number of active campaigns was a customization. Um, there um, are, you know, our back end, these campaigns sort of sit on the same level in our file as our Christmas campaign or our calendar contest. It's just a, they're in the independent campaign. So this is just a way to, like a, a multi-project feature. Um, have you found that a lot of this is focusing on the happy dog that we're using as a banner and mm -hmm. story? Has any of this worked on your other campaign areas or other projects that you've come up with? I don't know, say truck constables or car magnet work or anything else like that? Yeah, I think that's where, I mean, this is, this is three months old, you know, where we feel that we're sort of like, getting a hang on what works for our, our base. But certainly that project fundraising um, around, um, you know, I think probably one that I will do next spring would be um, fundraising for scholarship funds for our camps and tie that into the link between um, animal abuse and domestic violence and creating um, you know, safe, humane communities by working right with young children and, and building and that sort of, um, you know, where it could cost X amount to send a child to camp and, and have that sort of price point on it where people can send, you know, one, two, or three kids to camp. Um, and again, you know, some of the, um, we've, look, we've considered, we've sort of looked at our, our menu that we're usually providing to our major donors around um, items to, to see what would be adaptable for next year. But, um, but we also want to make sure that we, we don't, Exhaust by having, you know, what we found was that, you know, changing the topic once a month didn't work for our, our donors. They they wanted that sort of consistency. So we we don't want to end up with uh, twelve campaigns in a year rather than twelve single e blasts. And, but my my guess would be that this would work very well. Um, where and where I saw a sort of model that I borrowed from was a. Uh, collaboration or a partnership of a number of humane societies in the states who had done this with specific um, equipment that they needed purchased. And so it was, um, you know, this branch needs seven kennels and this branch needs 10,000 pounds of kitty litter and very specific things like that. So I, I see no reason why a model like that wouldn't do that same thing of people feeling uh, a very close link to what they were purchasing. I mean, it's very, um, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with Imagine One Day, which is local, but they are, you know, how they're building schools uh, in Ethiopia, and it's very much like a web store. You can go in and buy the latrine roof or the, um, the foundation for the cloakroom or like a physical thing. And I think that, you know, that model would translate really well. <laughs> Very much that sort of parallel of yeah. uh, thinking and acting and buying these at the time of that. Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering if you've had any success in converting any of your online donors into local people who have 
Yeah, so we um, follow up with our native file donors across, across multiple vehicles with a, a phone calling campaign to convert them to monthly donors at um, usually at about three months. So we haven't tested with this medical emergency crew yet to see how they're doing, uh, how they convert. We have um, fairly reasonable results with our, our donor chatter campaign uh, converting to monthly. So I mean, it's, you know, it pays for it pays for itself within the day, so it's worth doing. Yeah, what kind of conversion would you get on those online monthly? The new file online monthly, it's probably about five percent conversion. You said the writing the writing percent of donors is on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Which attribution model would you use for this number? Last click or attribution model? Attribution model. I, this is maybe where my my lack of tech savvy and <laughs> think something, but um, and we're within Give Together. I'm able to track sources where they're where they're um, where they've come in from. And so that's um, that's just what we're we're using. So we have a supporter list of about 18,000 people that have consented to get fundraising emails. So I'm like, you know, Castle opens that up for us a little bit to send fundraising emails, but I think it's the only area that Castle does open up. Um, so we've just found that, um, you know, we made a mistake one time of sending it to the list when we only had, right in the early stages, we had two animal stories up. There was, I think, under $1,500 left on the page, and we... Um, and we sort of put these artificial 30-day limits on campaigns, and it was like at day 29, and this was going to be our first non-success story, so like, we'll send out an e-blast. And, um, and we got donations to finish off those two campaigns <coughs> within something like um, 13 minutes, and then we started getting angry emails from people of like, hey, can't you find another injured animal for me to adopt today? <laughs> so, um, so that's just sort of us testing our limits of what the capacity is, and not wanting to, you know, if we can cover these costs without sending e glass um, and just doing it by people who, you know, have us bookmarked and keep checking back in or follow um, Facebook, or later on we'll, you know, we'll go back and uh, do some testing with online advertising again, then that saves up, you know, that frees up all our e blast space to be promoting um, cost for cause and our lottery and cupcake day and stuff like that. So, so it's ten thousand dollars. Yeah, ten thousand. Like yeah, no, it's ten thousand dollars of unfunded projects. It's sort of our, our new rule now of when we won't send out any blast unless we have that. Yeah. So we're we've um, yeah we built a. Of back end, um, we built the sort of import that it just so it's fairly easy now, which is a pain in the neck to begin with. We haven't been yet. Um, it's yeah, I mean, it's something, something I, I wouldn't sorry, I keep forgetting to repeat the question. So the question was, what do we pay to get our Facebook post to more closure? And we haven't been. For the medical emergency ones, um, and as a rule, for very few of our posts. So, again, it's something that I have on my list of things I'd be willing to test. But um, at you know the current point where I'm, you know, I'm sort of trying to this is a ridiculous fundraising problem to have, but I'm sort of trying to slow things down a bit. And so, um, you know, if uh, we in other things of testing paying for Facebook posts, we haven't. Found great results at all for fundraising, and so you know we we rather if we don't need to, we'd rather just direct that money elsewhere. But certainly, if we found we were needing to, I would test it. I think I'm getting close to my time. I'm over my time. Yeah, last time I was I was uh, right, doing right. just no, fine. No. Um, so just quickly, I'm just going to quickly sort of say, because that sort of led into what, what are we going to do next, and so just a, a couple of thoughts, and then we can take any other questions. So 
One of the things that this medical emergency has sort of, we've seen fade from the previous campaigns we were doing is peer-to-peer -peer sort of slipped away. We still, um, we, and we haven't made it a primary ask and it hasn't been necessary, but sort of looking at trying to start building incentive group challenges like this may be uh, a good you know, corporate challenge thing. If you have two, you know, two animals who have $2,500 in medical care, which company can and employees can um, can meet them for uh, meet the bill first or something like that. So looking at trying to introduce that peer to peer back in again. Um, as I mentioned, that um, teleconversion campaign to monthly donors. We're they're just about to go into our cycle for that, so we'll see how they perform. Um, one of the functionalities we want to add, start adding is a sign up for alerts. So people, when a new animal is added, they are getting an alert that says, you know. Fluffy from Kelowna with his, has just, uh, their medical case has just been added. Check them out here. And then we'll look at testing online advertising again. And then into next year, probably look at um, seeing whether we can use this model for other um, sort of very tangible, probably in this case, physical fundraising for physical equipment. Pardon, what did we use for peer to peer? Uh, the, so Give Together, which we've been using for this, has a peer-to-peer -peer model built in. We've also used, the, um, used some of the Kubiel functionality for our other programs, but for this one, we're using that. Obviously, you've got a quiet of higher-ups. Uh, what, if anything, were the challenges surrounding that with regards to this widespread adoption of social media? So, some of the... Some of the challenges uh, we found um, in terms of sort of internal has been, and this is something we've heard from some staff and never from a donor, is a concern that people would perceive that we were withholding medical care until we read, met a certain target, which is why we had to go back and put the language right up the front of, this animal will receive the care they need when it's medically appropriate. You help us, you know, fund it retroactively. And you know, trying to have that conversation of, I know you're not going to hold back on Fluffy's surgery, um, but it's not compelling fundraising if we say, actually, Fluffy had this surgery last Wednesday, and we paid for it because we're actually, like, our cash flow is fairly fine. And, we're just hoping that you'll throw in. So that was a, a real struggle, and that um, and that keeps that gets revisited. Even though we've addressed it on the website, that gets revisited um, every time. We're not very very careful with our Facebook posts around the um, that campaign. So you're talking about perception of accountability. You're monitoring. That. So the staff is monitoring that. We don't hear that from donors at all. We hear that from staff who have concerns about perception. So I don't think you're really going after Fluffy. Fluffy. Um, did you ever have a conversation about naming up points so broke down from that point you come to the type of operation or the group of animal or mm -hmm. you know, maybe keep it just a bit higher but then having stories about Fluffy and its operation times? I mean, that is sort of the model we've been using for Glass for a while of talking about a big picture need and giving one story as an example, and we found people didn't respond to it. They didn't feel um, that immediacy. And in terms of the type of operation done, one of the interesting things this does is this allows us to fundraise for things that are really not sexy at all, like hats with lots of tartar on their feet, which like no one's going to give to as a you know a surgical fund. But it means that this cat actually is losing weight and is malnourished because they can't eat, they're in so much pain. And so it, it is a real medical need, but unless it's sort of um, dressed up in, in a, you know, with its surrounding wrapper, we, we, um, we don't, we're not able to fundraise for it. And this we find people will email and say, you know, I looked at these all these stories and I thought, you know, it's very sad, the animals that have been hit by a car and had to have their leg amputated and the cat that was shot by pellets. But I figured other people would take care of that animal, those animals. And 
I, you know, that really sort of the underdog, excuse the pun, of people are purposely choosing the less sexy medical complaints because they feel that they're perhaps the only one that will take care of tartar on the guns. And <laughs> it's dueling hands. Is there anyone who hasn't asked a question yet? Okay, let's do two really quickly. I, I'm just curious if you segment your email list at all. If we segment her email list. Sorry, I was just going to ask what peer to peer asked, and that's what did they ask you? Yeah, we um, we didn't the first couple of times. We did uh, I like the peer. So we, we just went to um, everybody. Now you know. Now having more, um, now having more intelligence on it, we um, we have started doing some segmenting. For instance, around to our monthly donors, um, and that sort of can excuse the language of like, I can't believe you're asking me for a gift about a monthly donor. That we can say, you know, as a monthly donor, your the contribution that you make is tremendous. Would you, because clearly you really believe in us, would you help us out by expanding our circle so and sharing? Yeah, and send them a very specific peer-to-peer -peer instead. Um, other than that, I mean, we've done some testing around geographics and found that it really didn't make a difference. Um, we are now having three months and, and seeing how lapsed donors are doing. We're going to start segmenting more specifically to lapsed donors and try and, and make it much more targeted in our language to them. And we've done a whole pile of testing, which we're sort of um, starting to roll out of our, all our programs of what's what's working in our e-blasts and um, <coughs> and uh, yeah, stuff like that. Subject lines and clickable links and our like clickable images and stuff like that. And so we've been doing a fair bit of testing of the format of the e-blast, and are now sort of starting to look more at segmenting. Last question. So it's about two and a half years since we sort of switched to this sort of a more campaign model. Over that time, has this experience, this experience uh, <coughs> has, uh, changed your understanding of why your donors take this more model? And how, what are the motivations behind it? I mean, I think, you know, none of it's, none of it's anything that, you know, someone who's worked in direct mail for too many years. None of it's really new. Um, um, learnings around, you know, <coughs> making it personal, forgetting the statistics, really getting down to the story. I know mean, all that stuff we know. I think it's finding a way to translate those rules that I think still work, how they translate into an online online. Thank you.